93% of American adults believe math is essential to success. And yet, 53% of those same adults have said out loud, I can't do math. It's worse for our kids, where 56% prefer broccoli over doing their math homework. I think these facts tell us a really important story, and that is that as a society, we've done an amazing job of convincing everyone that if you can't do math, you're in trouble. But we've done a really poor job of making people feel like they can do math and making them want to do math. I mean, seriously, math is losing to broccoli. This is not good. Now, I see a world where every single day, math is becoming more vital to almost every field of endeavor. And in this environment, we cannot afford to raise another generation of kids that feels like they can't do math and doesn't want to do math. And I could see this problem even 15 years ago when I worked at Intel, that the United States is just not producing enough engineers and scientists. It's part of the reason I quit my job to pursue my passion of teaching kids math. Now, as I got into the field, I realized, you know, people have been trying to fix this problem for decades. And for the most part, they've been working on what do we teach the kids and how do we teach the kids. And we've made some progress, but I really feel like we're missing the point. We have to get kids to want to do math first. I mean, look, when it comes to reading, we know what to do. We read to our kids every night. But we don't read to them the dictionary or the encyclopedia. That would be crazy. What we do is we read things like Dr. Seuss books. They're fun. They're whimsical. They're colorful. They're engaging. We get our kids to enjoy reading first, and then we worry about spelling and grammar and all those other things. The same is true for sports. We take our kids out in the yard, we play the games, we figure out what they like. Once we know what they like, we sign them up for lessons and leagues and they can practice and become better players. Now imagine if all sports was practice and no games. No kid would ever want to play. And yet, that's exactly what we do with mathematics. We start with memorizing the facts and learning the skills, and we spend so much time on this that there's never any time left to do the fun things with mathematics. And I wonder, like, why did we lose all common sense when it comes to math? And I think there's two reasons. Number one, a lot of us believe that there's a math gene, that only some people can like it, and only some people can do it. And if you believe that, then what is the point of even making it interesting for everyone? And second, because of the way we all experienced school, we learned, we never learned what fun math looks like. But I tell you what, if you've ever done a Sudoku puzzle, or played a strategy game, or taken your friends out to do an escape room, then you've engaged in the kinds of thinking that are vital and essential to mathematics. And you did it for fun. And because we've all done these things, it really means that every single one of us is a math person. There is no such thing as the math gene. I know for me, I loved math as far back as I can remember. But what I loved about math was finding hidden patterns and looking for shortcuts in routine problems or solving a really challenging problem and feeling that thrill. I didn't want to do a bunch of repetitive, boring math problems just like everyone else. For me, math was irresistible, but school math was not. For most of us, we walked into classrooms, we sat in rows, and we waited for the teacher to put up a problem and tell us how it was done. Something like this. What is 546 minus 267? Now imagine if I asked you to do that, this right now, in your head as quick as you can. What would it feel like? Would you be feeling fear, confusion, boredom? Like, why do I even have to do this problem? Probably. And yet every single day, teachers walk into classrooms and they implicitly say to kids, you know what, I know you guys don't care about this stuff, but this is what we got to do because it's in the curriculum. Just grin and bear it. That is a horrible message to be sending to our kids. And so I set out on this journey to figure out how do I make school math irresistible for kids? And along the way, I discovered a secret, a place where even people who have said, I can't do math, will willingly take on challenges and persevere in solving them. Exactly the skills you need to be good at mathematics. And that place 
is video games. A video game. Video game designers have spent 40 years figuring out how to make learning environments where your mind is stretched to the limits and you experience flow. Now, you might be saying, wait, learning environment? Yeah, learning environment. Okay, Angry Birds taught you how to sling birds at pigs. And Pac-Man taught you how to eat dots while avoiding the ghosts. And millions of people have literally spent billions of hours playing these games. And no one ever asked, when am I ever going to use this in real life? <laughs> now, video game designers, they know how to give us dopamine hits. They've created these environments where we get this chemical released in our brain that makes us want to play again. It motivates us. It gives us a sense of pleasure. And they've done it without using any caffeine or any alcohol. And so as educators, I think it's imperative that we figure out how do they do that? What are the core principles of human learning and psychology that they're tapping into to make us play these games? So let's dive in and figure it out. Let's start with what is the definition of a game? Bernard Suits, philosopher, defines a game as the voluntary acceptance of unnecessary obstacles. Think about golf. It's the perfect example. What is the objective of golf? Put the ball in the hole. If that's all there was to it, you would just walk right up, drop the ball in the hole, and the game would be over. But nobody wants to play this game. We want to play the game where you have to take the giant sticks and hit the ball between the trees, over the water, and around the sand. It is the unnecessary obstacles themselves that make the game fun. And I love this definition because we can all agree that a math problem is an unnecessary obstacle. <laughs> if, you do it, if you do it voluntarily, then you are playing the game of math. So let's dive in to some of the things that video games do that we can do as educators. The first thing is they give you control of the action. Think about the average child's life. Most of their time is spent answering to adults, parents, and teachers. It's no wonder that when they get their hands on the game, they love being in control and being the hero of the story. Take the game Tetris as an example. In Tetris, you have to manipulate shapes made out of four squares as they fall to the bottom of the well to complete rows. Now, you don't sit and passively listen to lectures about how to play the game and how it works. You just dive right in and you start playing. Now, once I've got you playing the game, the video game designer will then make sure that they start the first level ridiculously easy. For those of you who have played Tetris, you probably forgot what level one feels like. This is it. So slow that there's a button that makes the pieces come down faster. This is a deliberate design choice. Plenty of time for you to figure out what happens when I rotate the shapes. How does this game work? Once you're invited into the game now, then we have progressive challenge. The pieces are going to come down a little bit faster and a little bit faster and a little bit faster until they're coming down at right, exactly the right speed for you as the player. And you're on the edge of your seat manipulating pieces. It's exhilarating, and you're in the zone. And your brain gets dopamine hits. Now imagine if the first time you played Tetris, it was on level 16, and the pieces are falling like rain. And they stack all the way up to the top before you have a chance to do anything. You would quit. We, so often, we give kids problems that feel like level 16 of Tetris, and they quit. And when they quit, they never get the dopamine hits. And if they never get the dopamine hits, they never get addicted to math. Now, the last thing about Tetris. This is how every game of Tetris ends. You lose. I have played thousands... <laughs> I have played thousands of hours of Tetris, and it's stunning how long it took me to figure out that I've lost every single time I've played. <laughs> and yet, you keep playing because the game seems fair and you have hope of success. And isn't that what we want our kids to feel when they're doing math? When they make a mistake, it's not, oh, I'm not a math person. It's, I can do this, I'm going to try again, because replays are free. And the last thing video games do really well is they make us curious. 
What is curiosity? Curiosity is the desire to learn. It's what's going to get you to voluntarily accept those unnecessary obstacles. Now, as math educators, we have to work hard to get kids curious about some of the things we teach, but we can do it. There's a lot of ways to do it. One way is to tell a story, but only tell the beginning and leave off the ending. People are going to want to know what happens next. Or you can say something surprising. Surprise always creates curiosity. Now, again, we violate these principles every single day. We don't take any time to get kids curious. We start with problems that aren't level one of Tetris. We lecture too much and don't give kids control. And we give grades that are final so they can't recover from their mistakes. And then we wonder, why do kids like broccoli instead of math? So let's apply these principles back to our subtraction problem. I'm a video game designer, and I have to figure out how to make you do this for fun. Step one, I got to make you curious. I'll try something surprising. What if I told you that everything you learned about subtraction was a lie? Would you be curious? Are you wondering what, it, what it, those things are? Yeah. Now you're about to volunteer to accept my unnecessary challenge. The next thing I've got to do is I've got to start ridiculously easy, and I'll do that as I tackle the first lie. The first lie is they told you you've got to start from the right and work your way to the left. Just not true. You can absolutely do math from left to right. You read from left to right. You might as well do your math from left to right. Let's try this problem. 546 minus 314. Start from, from the left. 500 minus 300, 200. 40 minus 10, 30. 6 minus 4, 2. Bam, just like that. You can absolutely go left to right. If that makes sense, we've completed level one of Tetris. It's time to progressively increase the challenge. Let's take on the second lie they told you. They said, look, you can't take seven from six, but you absolutely can. You know what it is. It's negative one. That's level two of Tetris. Now let's put these things together and increase the challenge one more time. 546 minus 267, our original problem. Let's start from the left, and here we go. 5 minus 2 is 3. 4 minus 6, negative 2. 6 minus 7, negative 1. Now that looks kind of funny, right? But we know something about math. Let's see if we can make sense of this next challenge. That 3 in the hundreds column really means 300. That negative 2 means minus 2 tens or minus 20. And the negative 1 is minus 1. Now that's something I can do. 300 minus 20, 280. 280 minus 1, 279. Bam. I know, right? Let's try one more just to make sure you got it. 632 minus 387. Here we go. 600 minus 300 is 300. 30 minus 80 is minus 50. 2 minus 7, negative 5. We can put this together. 245. Now, if you're looking at this and you're saying, wow, that's cool. I wish somebody would have taught me that. And then you're wondering, are there other secrets that nobody told me? <laughs> Are there patterns I never found? Could my life have been easier? If so, welcome to the world of irresistible math. Now, I've been going around the country talking to teachers about curiosity and these video game design principles. And they've been walking into classrooms, getting kids curious, starting with level one Tetris problems, giving kids some control, inviting them into the problems. And when they make mistakes, they're able to fix them. And these kids are becoming the problem solvers they never thought they could be. I've even had teachers come up to me and say, believe it or not, my kids are excited to come to math class now, and I can't believe how much they're capable of. That is super powerful. So let's not spend the next several decades arguing about what we teach and how we teach. Let's figure out how to bring curiosity and wonder and joy back into the classroom and make math irresistible for kids. Because I think we can all agree that some of the biggest problems that our planet faces and that humanity faces can be solved with big data, scientific research, artificial intelligence, and innovation. And math is at the heart of all of those things. Let's use these principles, make math irresistible for kids, and raise a generation of kids that changes the world. Thank you.